Well, folks, welcome. Uh, sorry, we're a few minutes behind schedule, a few technical difficulties, uh, but uh, excited to have Dan Butner join us today for the for today's longevity project, uh, longevity uh, book club session. Uh, I'm going to give a brief interview uh, overview um, introduction and then uh, turn it over to Martha um, and uh, begin the conversation with Dan. So, at the beginning of his new book, "The Blue Zone: Secrets for Living Longer," Dan Butner observes. Most of what we think will help us live longer and healthier is misguided or just plain wrong. It's quite an opening way, way to start off a conversation, but for the last two decades, Dan has been telling Americans that their vision of healthy aging, diet, fat diets, expensive exercise equipment, shotgunning vitamins does not necessarily translate into longer, healthier lives. Instead, as we all know, Dan has traveled the world from Okinawa to Costa Rica and now on to Singapore to discover the secrets of healthy aging and to make them less secret by sharing them with the world through the stories of the Blue Zones. In his latest book, Dan returns to the Blue Zones to further refine these lessons, and we're terribly pleased to welcome to today's Longevity Book Club to share some of those secrets today. I'm not going to give a long introduction because Dan is synonymous with the Blue Zones, and the Blue Zones are known the world over. Uh, but one lesser known fact about Dan, just to round out the picture, he holds three Guinness Book World Records for distance cycling, and as reported, though I don't know this is quite true, um, this will be the first question, that of all, out of all of his many, many accomplishments, he is most proud of having received a speeding ticket while cycling. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, John, Dan, for joining us today. Um, Martha's going to do the first questions, but uh, is that is that a story uh, apocryphal or is it true? Well, it's true, but, you know, it's not necessarily my proudest moment, but I just, <laughs> you know, my biking friends, they all, they all kind of... They, they like that little ribbon. Fantastic. So, Dan, thank you for joining us. I know it's been a, a busy couple of weeks for you, so congratulations on the, the new book and uh, all the terrific press and the Netflix production. That's also a, a, a pretty interesting uh, series, so thank you for that. Um, you know, we've been hearing about, and you've obviously been involved in the Blue Zones for a long time, uh, but I don't know the genesis of the story. How did you get involved and interested in the Blue Zones? What was the thing that um, caught your eye early on? And what was, what's been the most memorable experience you've had over the past 20 or so years? Well, I've been a, a, a lifelong explorer. I, I'm National Geographic explorer. And uh, actually for about six years, I had a company. Uh, we had a full-time team of uh, uh, 14 people, including archaeologists and bio, uh, biologists and camera people and and writers and and we uh, we um, we made it our business to solve ancient mysteries. Why the Maya civilization collapsed? Did Marco Polo go to China? And I got very good at um, um, our team did at networking with the best scientists and getting sort of doing, for lack of a better metaphor, a meta analysis and solving these mysteries. And uh, it was my brother, Nick, actually, who was working for me at the time, who stumbled upon a report in 1999 that showed that Okinawa had the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world. And I said, aha, that's a good mystery. Um, they're, they're a melting pot. I knew that. Uh, so there's nothing genetic going on there. And uh, they're an ancient people, the Ruku's kingdom. And I go, what? I'm going to go solve that mystery. And we did a really sort of facile pre-Blue Zone expedition there in 1999. And I just got personally fascinated with it. I knew the people who followed us uh, loved it. And uh, I pitched uh, the idea of reverse engineering longevity to National Geographic in the year 2003. And it took them about a year to assign it. It took us another year or so to hire the demographers to find verified areas in the world where people are living the longest. By the way, if you don't take that step, the, your work is worthless. Um, so there's all, there's all kinds of hearsay blue zones, like Vilcabamba Valley of Ecuador, the Caucasus, um, the Hunza Valley, those have all been debunked. Uh, we work with a worldwide network of demographers, went parsed through worldwide census data, and we know the places that we name blue zones have either the highest uh, centenarian concentration over time or the lowest rate of middle age mortality, which is really kind of the best uh, longevity metric out there because it factors out infant mortality. 
So over the past 20 years, as you've revisited the, revisited the original Blue Zones, um, you know, I know you've seen some dramatic changes, but what what have you what changes have you taken most to heart? Like, are either most exciting or most disappointing? Well, since I identified the blue zones beginning in two thousand three, we identified our last blue zone in two thousand nine. They've attracted hundreds of academics, and I've had a front row seat. You know, I'm not a scientist myself; I'm a science writer. I'm good at. I understand. I can read the papers, but I don't do the the, the tougher epidemiology or the controlled studies. And I've been able to see. So, you know, a few things we've we found uh, demographically speaking that uh, actually it was the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica that probably produces the most male centenary. It's about eight times more than we see in America. Um, we see uh, uh, in, in uh, Sardinia, for example, you know, it was often thought when we first went there that there was a genetic component Hmm. Uh, and indeed, that is a genetically pure, relatively speaking, second only to Iceland, pure population. But interestingly, we saw when you look at the spouses of centenarians, so they don't share any genetic overlap, they're more likely to live longer uh, living in proximity to the centenary than a centenarian's brother. So hmm. that kind of leads you to some clues that it's either... Um, some sort of lifestyle contagion or life shared lifestyle, or it might be um, a bacterial exchange. It might be there if you live with a centenarian, their microbiome is such that, you know, you're kissing presumably your spouse and, you know, sharing the same pot of food and so forth that maybe, so um, it, it's an ongoing thing. And, and finally, I just read a survey of 90 year olds uh, over 190 year olds in Icaria, and over 80 percent of them drank wine every day of their adult life. And I, you know, I'm familiar with the controversy of alcohol, and you know, the World Health Organization saying it's not safe at any level. But I can tell you, in blue zones, people are drinking moderately every day, usually with friends and with food, and they're still making it into not their 90s or 100 with a fraction of the rate of of a chronic disease than Americans do. So Dan, Dan could I ask his question as just as follow up? Um, uh, one of the things I, I saw in, in, in this book was um, almost a little sense of regret uh, about some globalization of some of the areas like in Okinawa. Uh, I think you noted some of the practices that you observed 20 years ago, a little bit declining with the next generation. Um, is globalization threatening some of the blue zones? Absolutely. As soon as the American food culture comes in the front door, longevity goes out the back door. So all I would say all the blue zones are under siege. I'd say Okinawa is no longer a blue zone. I mean, if they, their, their numbers don't make blue zone standards, I mean, you can still go there and, find, and see the lifestyle, uh, blue zone lifestyle still survives in some of the small villages, but it's not a healthy place to live as a whole island anymore, or whole archipelago. Uh, Costa Rica, uh, the Nicoya, it breaks my heart. I mean, the, one of the greatest examples of longevity in the world. And now they're letting Burger King and McDonald's and KFC and chips. And, you know, and this, this make no mistake about it, the standard American diet for an average 20-year-old shaves about 10 years off your life expectancy as a, as compared to eating, say, a blue zone, whole food, whole plant-based food diet. And, uh, it you know, it's just terrible that they've adopted the worst that America has to offer. And their diabetes rights, rates are shooting upward. Their obesity rates are shooting upward. And we'll lose uh, the longevity phenomenon probably a half a generation. Um, so, Dan, a, a question already from the audience. Um uh, how much of the benefit of alcohol do you think is due to the social factors versus what is in the alcohol? You know, it's <laughs> to use a metaphor, it's quite literally a cocktail, right? I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> we know alcohol lowers the cortisol. Um, we know that there's certain antioxidants in red wine that, uh, that reduce inflammation of the endothelial, the lining of the artery. Um, we know a glass of wine with a plant-based meal about quadruples the, the flavonoid absorption. And we know it tends to um, grease social gears and bring people together. 
humans have been drinking wine for at least 6,000 years. You know, was, Jesus was said to make wine for his weddings and so forth. Um, you know, I, I just have a hard time with with uh, uh, these l latest sort of trendy proclamations saying that we, that's part of our life we can't enjoy. I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest anybody start drinking if you and if you have problems with it, obviously don't restart. But um, it, I, I'll just tell you, it's not mutually exclusive with living a long, healthy life. And we don't know exactly why. Well, I think that's true with a lot of these things that there are, there are few absolutes. Uh, and we we tend to make the, these uh, discussions about you know it's either all or nothing. So uh, I yeah. Sort of by by the way, you know oxygen uh, is is an oxidant. You know it's that's corrosive for us. And breathing pure oxygen is bad for us. Sunlight, too much sunlight is bad for you. So you know it's 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 a dose dependent um, and and situational dependent. Um, um, indulgence, I guess. So Dan, I, I, you said it's disappointing to see some of these naturally occurring blue zones sort of falling, uh, you know, falling from favor as they, they, as they sort of see globalization impact them. But there's also a movement around man-made blue zones. How successful are, and you talked about a couple of them in the book, um, how successful are these sort of programs that put into place programs and activities that promote kind of blue zone lifestyles? Yes. Well, enormously successful because they prove it can be done. I mean, so, so many of us just throw up our arms, you know, obesity has been climbing. It's tripled since 1980, type two diabetes and pre-diabetes up by a factor of seven since 1980 life expectancies dropped every year for the last three years. And people just say, we give up. Uh, what our Blue Zones projects have done is show that you can reverse that curve. We've been successful in many communities at lowering the population level. And it, it's not a program. It, when you distill the wisdom of Blue Zones, it, it distills down to this. People in Blue Zones, they're not more disciplined. They don't have better individual responsibility. They don't have better diet plans. They don't have better supplements or exercise programs. Uh, they don't pursue health at all in the way we pursue health, almost maniacally. Uh, health and longevity ensue from the right environment. They live in places where every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, it occasions a walk. They, the cheapest, most accessible, and most delicious foods are peasant foods. Whole grains, tubers, garden vegetables, greens, nuts. Beans, if you're eating a quarter cup of beans a day, it's probably worth four years of life expectancy. The option to, to recede into your home or your handheld device hasn't hit yet. Um, mm -hmm. So they're out in the streets socializing face to face. They have vocabulary for purpose and they understand they, they, they're, they're working for purpose also metabolizes a service element. So they're out. Um, uh, uh, put, they, they feel a meaning in their life by um, serving their community in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th so these are the things that work when it comes to the blue zone, and, and they're long-lasting things. And when we come into blue zone cities, we come in not trying to, you know, like Fort Worth was one of our our favorite blue zone cities, a million people or so. We didn't come in trying to convince a bunch of beef eaters to start eating beans. Uh, we came in and we had uh, policy bundles for food built that favored the healthy option over the the uh, junkie option and uh, for built environment that favored the pedestrian and the cyclist over the motorist and tobacco that favored the non-smoker over the smoker. And we didn't come in and tell Texans what they have to do. It's a good way to get, you know be shown the door. But rather, we went through a consensus process. We said, here's our menus. Policy menus that have worked elsewhere. Let's look at each one for number one, effectiveness. Would it work in Fort Worth? And number two, feasibility. Is there a political will to get this done in five years? And amazingly, in each of those three areas, we found five or six policies we could actually get passed. Our teams went into every restaurant, grocery store, workplace, school, and church. And we offered Blue Zone certification 
for places that were willing to to um, rethink their designs and their policy to favor healthier eating, mindless moving, uh, social social connectedness, and purpose. And then, you know, we have 30 or so ways that these places could do that. Once it got uh, 60 percent or so, we gained Blue Zone certification. And then we had a program for individuals to help them shape their homes and their social circles and give them a purpose workshop and volunteer. So when you when you take people, places and policy, all three of those uh, focusing on trying to optimize people's environment so set them up for success make their unconscious choices a little bit healthier all day long and gal measured it on the front end they measure it on the back end and we have never failed at making a community healthier that's powerful it, we've proved it can work so there's a question just came in um <laughs> A lot of interesting questions coming in. I encourage people to keep putting questions in the Q and A and chat. But um, one question was: um, Are there any blue zones in Africa? Um, and perhaps they don't meet the uh, statistical uh, life expectancy measure. But I'm curious about whether there are places there that outperform other parts of the continent that uh, you think is worthy of note. Well, you know, I actually bike from the top of Africa to the bottom of Africa, and I know it very intimately. And there are a lot of blue zone habits. You know, the, most of Africa, people are still walking and growing their own gardens and connected, you know, tribally for sure in many cases. The problem, the reason there's no blue zones by our calculation is because of infectious disease. Uh, people are dying prematurely from cholera and, and uh and, and malaria and dysentery and, and you know even diarrhea. So the, the blue zones that I need, they, they not only benefit from modern public health, you know, the reason we're living so long mainly is because in the last century we've eliminated uh, the, the mortality rates from infectious diseases. And that's because of vaccinations and antibiotics. You know, our great grandfathers, if they stepped on a nail, they it got an infection. It was death. You know, now, now we have antibiotics. Um, blue zones have the benefit of modern health, uh, public health. They also, by the way, uh, except for the American blue zone, they have free access to health care. So universal health care. And uh, then they also have this uh, unique culture that has uh, selected, I would say, over time, uh, the lifestyle characteristics that we know drive longevity. So an interesting follow on to that from uh, from the audience. Um, how did COVID affect the blue zones? Not as bad. Far lower rates of COVID mortality for two reasons. The first reason is uh, most of the people dying from COVID had comorbidities. And you have the reason blue zones are blue is that they have much lower rates of chronic disease and therefore less mortality from getting a COVID infection. The other thing is um, they don't warehouse their old in retirement homes, which were just COVID mortality pits. Uh, mm -hmm. At least up up where I live in Minnesota, you know, they, it was a death sentence to be in a, a retirement home. Here they stay in the family where they got really good care, uh, less likely to be exposed to you know, other older people who might have the disease that could, you know, spread like wildfire through the, through the residents. But that actually relates to another question we have been, um, uh, what can we learn from blue zones on how to deal with caregiving? Uh, I mean, do they have all the multiple generations living with each other, value elders, provide collective support for each generation uh, and the like? Is there a, is there a thread of care that runs through the blue zones that uh, we should do? Yes. And it's nuanced. So the first and best resource is to keep our aging parents nearby. Um, and I, ideally, there's something called the grandmother effect that shows a household with a grandmother or a grandfather, their kids have lower rates of mortality. They tend to do better in school. But we're a little misguided when it comes to care. You know, we, we want to put our aging parents in the nicest uh, retirement home with the best uh, TVs and uh, the garden. Uh, but what happens is when people lose their sense of purpose, we know they die quickly. In Japan, the people who have the highest mortality rates 
our uh, at retirement, our cops and, and university professors, because they had a very clear sense of meaning, a very clear sense of, of status. And when they lost that, they died very quickly. I think that happens at a lesser event when we take away uh, the meaningful and the opportunity for older people to contribute, not just care, uh, but in blue zones, grandma lives at home, but she's not just a recipient of care. She's uh, in charge of cooking. She maintains the food tradition. She's out maintaining the garden. When mom's running off to work, she's taking care of the grandkids. Um, the grandfathers, you know, in my Netflix documentary, we have a grandfather who's living at home and helping teach his kids math. And they're the ones in other blue zones that typically know the agricultural wisdom of when to plant and when to sow and uh, when, to, when to harvest and, and how to make the wine. So this is repository of wisdom and talent and resiliency that the blue zones, they harness for the good of everybody. But it also turns out to be the good of the older person themselves because they have a reason to get up in the morning, to take their medicines, to stay active, to keep their brain engaged, and to feel like they're useful. Um, so what is what is the role, so totally by, by into meaning and purpose is really, you know, continually proving to be kind of central to sort of healthy longevity. Uh, where does lifelong learning fit into this? It's something we talk about a lot at the Center on Longevity. Well, you're right. I mean, so we know that people who, I, well, you know, I mean, when I wrote my article for National Geographic, the National Institutes on Aging was really helpful. So I was privy to the research they're doing in America. You know, the more education is is uh, associated with higher life expectancy. So people who get into their graduate degrees are living considerably longer than people who just have a high school. So you could extrapolate that lifelong learning is going to be good for all of us. Uh, but, you know, in in um, in several blue zones, I noticed that um, there were about 20 times more poets among male centenarians than you would expect to see in a normal population in um, in uh, in, say, America or even Italy. And, and that suggests they're using their minds in, in ways um, the older women. There's always a craft that uh, keeps their brains engaged. A, a knitting or a, a, a sort of a crochet, pottery ma making. You know, it's not like they're they're toddling off to classes, but they're always learning, mm -hmm. and they're they're keeping their brains engaged. And in in the blue zone communities, um, do you see? I mean, we're also advocates about the importance of intergenerational connections, both familial and uh, sort of extended family or community. Do you see those kinds of connections happening and important in blue zone uh, communities? Right. Well, as I just mentioned about keeping aging parents living with you, that's that's um, I mean that's way more intergenerational than what we do. But yes, in villages, um, for example, in Ikaria, they have this wonderful practice called a panigiri. And they, there's 90 villages in Icaria, and between May and October, each one of these villages has a huge party. And the party usually begins at 10 at night and goes till 8 or 9 the next morning. And they're drinking wine and locking arms and twirling and dancing at 3 in the morning, eating goat liver and drinking some more. And this is not just a bunch of 20-year-olds. You have 80, 90, even 100-year-olds showing up. They, everybody shows up. It provides an opportunity for the community to coalesce, to get physical activity, to blow off some stress. And by the way, uh, you have to pay for your wine and you have to pay for your food at these festivals, but it's all donated food and wine. So all that money they raise then goes to some community project. So they're helping out the community by just showing up and, and partying. And so th this is very intergenerational. Mm -hmm. um, it's very rare to see like a young person's pub and an old person's pub. You know, I go to Thea's guest house in Nas, which has a great blue zone restaurant and a deck. And you see kids running out there. You see, you know, 40 year old communist bitching about the state of capitalism. And you'll see some tourists from Israel who've come to look at a blue zone. And you'll see some 80, 90 year olds 
getting together over a glass of wine. Uh, that's where you want to be, I think. So, so Dan, um, you added a new blue zone in your latest book. Um, uh, I won't spoil it for the audience yet. I'll let you do that. I'll let you tell about it. Uh, but it's a very different one from the uh, places you have typically covered over the last 15 years. Um, how uh, Tell us about sort of finding a new blue zone um, and how you thought about it as a very different type of community than the places you've typically written about. So I've lamented seeing the original blue zone deteriorate with the American food culture and globalization. So I, I got to thinking, I wonder if you could manufacture a blue zone. And uh, for National Geographic, I did a cover story on, on uh, worldwide happiness, a data back story back in 2018, which occasioned a visit to Singapore. And um, along the way, I noticed this, they had the highest uh, health adjusted life expectancy in the world. It goes by the acronym HALE, H-A-L-E. So that's uh, years of life, years lived in full health. And they live about a dozen years longer than us. And I also knew that Singapore is a new, brand new, invented nation. And, and when I was a kid, Singapore was a fishing village. And now it's five and a half million people, one of the most uh, successful economies in the history of humankind a melting pot of Chinese, Indian, and Malay people, very diverse, that produces 12 more good years of health in America. So uh, I, I, I named it a, a Blue Zone 2.0 because they've, they've, they've engineered health and they've done it in ways that American policymakers ought to be paying attention to. And what are the things about uh, Singapore um, and maybe other similar uh, large, complicated cities that do well, like Hong Kong or well, um, for, for, what? Do they, what do they do that makes it special? Well, first of all, they have a they have an eye, on, you know, economic development, but they put the health and well being of their people in front of business interests. So, over in Singapore, you don't have a bunch of lobbyists from the soda industry and the uh, chip industry and the Cattlemen's Association with an army of, of powerful lobbyists influencing lawmakers. They, uh, instead, you their their uh, um, ministers are well paid, um, Ivy League educated um, uh, people who are data driven. So they, for example, knew that the the, the um, country would quickly be overwhelmed with traffic back in the eighties, and they. Uh, they started subsidizing public transportation and walkability, uh, nice sidewalks, trees, covered walkways, beautiful gardens, beautiful parks. Um, they subsidized public transportation, a, a fast, efficient, clean, safe, that's accessible to everyone. Meanwhile, if you want to drive, a uh, car costs about triple what it does in the United States. Gas is two or three times more. Now you're you're levying huge levies if you want to drive your car everywhere. So what you get is about 90% of the population who is walking to work, walking to their friend's house, walking out to out to eat, and they're getting that that unconscious physical activity. They have a fraction of the rate of obesity we do in the United States, not because they have better gyms or better, you know, CrossFit or yoga classes. Uh, it's just they walk places. They've also have the political courage to tell the soda companies that they can't have as much sugar in their soda. So a Singaporean soda has 20% less sugar than an American soda does. Uh, they subsidize healthy food like brown rice and they tax unhealthy food like Swiss chocolate. Um, so, um, and you know, when you're talking about intergenerational, uh, people actually get a, a, an incentive uh, by having their aging parent living with them. The government actually gives them money if their aging parent lives near them or with them or even near them. And they know that even if your aging mom lives down the block, you're going to be over there taking care of her. So instead of uh, building fancy retirement communities and you know selling them to making money off of them, uh, they they put their incentives in keeping extended families together and harnessing 
the kind of Confucian values of respective elders and respective authorities and and respective the family. Uh, so Dan, you you live in Miami now, right? Yes. So there was a question about uh, can you discuss the world's first blue zone center in Miami with Adventist Health, and then I'd also like to ask you know what have you you know what was your what was your decision to move to Miami? Was it blue zone ish or something else? Well, we have blue zone cities in um, Jacksonville and um, um, and in, in Naples, in Collier County. So I was going there a lot. And, um, you know, I, I used to live in Minnesota. It gets really cold here. <laughs> and I like warm weather. So I, you know, I looked at every place and ended up in Miami. Uh, the Blue Zone Center in Miami, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't really, you know, I, I sold most of Blue Zones and the Adventists do what they see prudent, but uh, I, I don't have anything to do with the, the center. And and um, that's probably all I have to say about it. So add on, someone just asked, do war does warm versus cold climate make a difference? Well, so this is a very interesting observation. I saw cent I saw a centenary heat map of Japan, which is about a thousand miles long. And you see that the way up in the north, where people, there's only one growing season, they tend to pickle their food, eat more beef and pork and so forth. Um, not very many centenarians up there. But as you move south, the, the dots indicating centenarians get so profuse that Okinawa is completely covered in this sort of uh, concentration of centenarians. I think the sweet spot is about the 20th parallel north. So about you know, where you guys are actually in, in Palo Alto or, or Florida, um, you know, and that, that equates to uh, Southern Italy and Southern Greece. And, um, and the reason is in tropics, uh, you tend to have infectious diseases dragging life expectancy down. And in the North, uh, people are in indoors too much and they tend to eat canned and pickled food. Uh, the sweet spot, I think, is where you can have a couple growing seasons or three growing seasons a year. Oh, so, Dan, I, I'm, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, um, that start with something about um, angry at sort of what's happened in the United States and wondering whether there's a way out um, in, in terms of improving, improving health in the U.S. I'm curious what you think of sort of the priorities are for a, a big, complicated, diverse uh and sometimes angry country like the U.S. in terms of uh, public health. Um, yeah, so, well, it's consensus. You know, we, we I think if the federal government uh, had a uh, brought together the best thinkers in America who knew how to optimize, design our cities for health, and, um, and then listen to what would be... Um, if that, what they believe is effective and what they believe is feasible, we would find a lot of low hanging fruit. And we don't realize this, but uh, cities that are walkable have much higher economic vitality than 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 the than uh, the cities that are crisscrossed with traffic. And and we get it all wrong when we induce demand by building wider. Um, you know our. our the, the problem, there's no villain. We like to we like to point to villain. Those food companies are bad, or the cattle industry is bad, or processed food, they're bad. It's not. Until 1970, there weren't enough calories to go around in America. Yeah. It was exactly. a cold, cold war issue. And, um, you know, Earl Botts, Nixon's uh, Secretary of a Agriculture, you know, a lot of people don't like Earl Butts, but he did a good job at creating that that the incentives to to grow efficiently the uh, wheat corn soybeans rice um and and getting it getting it out to uh, americans and that's what we, and then the the food companies they do what food companies are supposed to do they take these these plentiful inputs and they feed it to animals and 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 they make chips out of it and they make processed foods and cereals and that. And for a while, when that was just a small percentage of our dietary intake, it wasn't so bad, but now we've gotten too good at it. We've gotten too good at making these, these empty calories taste irresistible. Madison Avenue has gotten too good at marketing them to us and getting into our brains and 
relentlessly trying to sell us these things. And we've just over innovated. And now the opportunity, and by the way, there's a there's a amount of money, $4.4 trillion we're shoveling at the problem right now, that if we get this divert a quarter of that to keeping people healthy in the first place, um, we could we could make a huge difference. And I do think the farm bill should be revisited. And uh, you know, we we oversubsidize these inputs for junk food, chips, sodas. Um, you know, cattle, feedlock, feed. Uh, it's just not good for us. If we started uh, shifting some of those subsidies for foods we know are good for us. Beans, by the way. Learning how to make beans-based delicious. Whole grains. You know, fresh produce. Everybody loves fresh produce, but it's so expensive. Well, that's the result of our agricultural system. We incent the, the wrong things, in my opinion. So Dan, you know, um, since we, there's a sort of growing evidence that we know the right things to do with our diet, with exercise, with social engagement, um, why aren't more people just doing it? Well, I think we're marketed the wrong things. So diets is a good idea. It's a good. I think we have most of the people listening right now know we ought to be eating more vegetables and more whole grains and beans and so forth and less meat and processed food. But we live in a food environment where 95 of the 100 choices we confront are unhealthy. And, um, you know, we, we keep beating this dead horse. And usually at New Year's resolution where you get on a new diet and try to change your behavior. And we fail by January 19th. Um, it's not to we're, we're aiming at the wrong target. Uh, we're trying to change behavior and that fails for almost all the people almost all the time. Whereas we need to shift it to change our environment. My books um, a little bit in this book that you guys have, but also I wrote a book called the blue zone challenge, which offers evidence-based ways to set up your kitchen, your social circle, your workplace, your commute, your bedroom, so that the healthier choice is unconscious. Mm. I got nothing to sell you. You know, I, I'm not nearly as rich as I could be because I don't have a supplement or I don't have a quick blue zone, quick you know, superfood. I hate that. There's no superfood out there. Um, instead, it's it's shifting the paradigm. Same with exercise. I hate to say it, but exercise is an unmitigated public health failure. 23% of Americans get the minimum uh, uh, 20 minutes a day of movement. It ain't working. Yet we keep, uh, we got to exercise. No, no, we need to change our environment so people are nudged into movement every 20 minutes like Blue Zone. We need walkable communities. Uh, we need to get the mechanical conveniences out of our house. So we're just still doing housework and kitchen work by hand, and, you know, putting in gardens. Uh, that's what works. We don't need a lot of exercise. We just need it throughout the day, low intensity physical activity. Nobody in blue zones are in CrossFit. None of them are in the cover of Triathlon magazine, but they're all making it to 100. And what do they do? They grow radishes. They walk to their friend's house. That's it. So this suggestion in the chat that you start a blue zones restaurant, I guess that's not in the offing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we certify restaurants. There's a number of restaurants in Miami. There's a place called, there's one in Culver City called Love Life. Uh, that's very blue zone. And um, the, the the restaurants that make whole plant-based food delicious, man, I'll put blue zones all over that all day long. I don't want to be a restaurateur, but I love reward. I love recognizing uh, food environments that make it easy to eat the right way. So then you mentioned uh, a moment ago, advice on how to set up your social circles. Uh, here in the U.S., the Surgeon General has declared a loneliness crisis, uh, but the Blue Zone communities are often very closely knit. So what what's the advice to people on this uh, on the Zoom um, about how to improve their social capital and social connections? Yeah, first of all, take all your time and resources that you're putting in uh, diets or supplements and put it in Curating your social circle. We know that if your three best friends are obese and unhealthy, there's about 150% better chance that you'll be overweight yourself. So I wouldn't tell you to dump your old friends, but I would tell you to proactively adding a few good friends 
Um, and they should be friends whose idea of recreation is pickleball. But friends who challenge you mentally. They play chess with you. Friends who care about you on a bad day. And it's not a bad idea to have a vegan or vegetarian in your immediate social network because they're going to show you where and how to eat health, delicious plant-based food. But take, you you know, it, and I understand, by the way, you know, we're middle age or so. Uh, making new friends isn't easy, but it's not as hard as you think. Easy way to do it, start volunteering. Volunteer at a place. You like animals, go down the Humane Society. You're going to meet other animal lovers with whom you share values. Uh, you like to feed old people, you know, the uh, food shelves. Whatever it is, volunteering is a good way to meet new people. And then I do, I've actually done this in my own life. I go through my contact and I look for people who I know are healthy, are going to be good influence. And I proactively ask them out for lunch. I have a place called in Minneapolis called Dow Foods. Uh, it, you can't you can't get an unhealthy meal there. I schedule two lunches every single week with friends that I want to bring into my media social circle uh, because I know they would enrich me. So, and I pick up lunch. I pay for lunch. You know, instead of uh, the other fatty things, F A D D Y fatty things, um, uh, making good friends. Why? Friends have measurable impact on our behavior, number one. And number two, when it comes to longevity, there's no short-term fix. There's nothing you can do this week or this month or even this year that's going to make you live better 40 years from now. You have to think about things that last years or decades or a lifetime. And picking the right friend, that's a, that could be a lifelong adventure or at least a very long-term adventure. And that the picking the right friend will influence you unconsciously for indeterminate amounts of time. So there you go. So, so he, oh, go ahead, Ken. So just as a little bit of a follow up to that, and, and sorry, Martha, uh, I'll ask the question step out of the way. But um, uh, how does technology play into fostering okay. friendships? Did I steal your question, Martha? I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> so. right, good. Uh, we think a lot. Um, that's why we're friends. Uh, is it, is yeah. it help or hurt? Yeah. Well, look, I'm meeting you guys for the first time right here, and I, you know, we're already on the friendship path. And uh, if you invite me out for dinner, I I would come, and we'd have a you know dinner. So I, I think I think technology can be a facilitator of getting bringing people together, but not a replacement. Um, so. You know, if you're using Instagram to find like-minded people to do, go, you know, play racquetball with, I love it. But if you're sitting in your house scrolling for two hours, you know, that's a bad thing. So, um, and I'm, you know, we at Blue Zones here, uh, we're, we're not aware of any uh, technology that has worked for um, getting people to move more or eat better. You know, we've heard of the pedometers. You guys are old enough to remember that craze. And then there's the Fitbit craze. And now there are gadgets on our phone that purport to get us moving more. And they work for a few months, but then we forget about them. That doesn't work. And the calorie counting gadgets, again, they'll work for a few months. But I challenge anybody uh, to show me an app that works for more than uh, you know a year uh, at changing our health. I, I, I'm not aware of it. But so I think, you know, it's better to turn to your neighbor rather than turn to your technology for, for longevity. Yeah, lots of suggestions in the chat about, you know, technology sites that allow you to make connections, whether it's meetups or, you know, but they're all sort of talking about how do you make connections that aren't just yeah. uh, Zoom calls. So um, lots of support in the chat for that. Thumbs, thumbs up for that. Yeah. Um, so Dan, can I ask you, uh, since I am a cook and I was, as I was slipping through the book, I was, you know, dog earing some of the recipes. Do you have a favorite one? My favorite is always the Malif Minestrone. I have it for breakfast every morning. It's whatever vegetables I have on hand, uh, three beans, some, some barley, always tomato, always olive oil, always red pepper, oregano, finished with an extra virgin olive oil. And, um, I know that if I start my day with that, I got half my fiber. It's low glycemic, so I eat it in the morning and it carries me through noon. 
I, I get all my protein, more protein in a bowl of that than there is in a, you know, in a couple of links of sausages and an egg. And um, um, yeah, I have the recipe. But if you come to danbutner.com, even if you don't get the book, danbutner.com, I have the minestrone recipe there. And um, also a newsletter called Eating to 100, where I, I'm always giving tips on how to how to eat for the long run. So uh, bringing in another question uh, from the audience. Um, it's about the difference between healthy longevity for men and women. So uh, um, obviously women, most places live longer and more healthfully than men. Um, why is that? Is that, is, is that part due to social connections, uh, ability to make friends? Uh, what's, what's the story there, Dan? Well, interestingly, in America, for every one male centenarian, there are five female centenarians. Yeah, but amazing. in our blue, yeah. in our blue zones, the proportion is one to one. In mm. in Nicoya, in Okinawa, and in uh, not in Okinawa, I'm sorry, in Icaria, Sardinia, and Costa Rica, the proportion is one to one. So it might not have to be that that women live longer. Um, but in general, I think women are better at social connection. You know, the, the, you guys out there, you know, it's a little harder for us to be socially connected. Um, women tend to be uh, the CEO of the household, so they have more control over the uh, food. And I, I think that control um, uh, drives them to uh, work a little harder to find the healthy choices. I know the demographic of Blue Zone, we're about 83 or 84 percent, you know, women. So the women are obviously more interested in health, at least by my reckoning. And mm -hmm. um you know, it, it might be a hormonal thing. I mean, testosterone, we all know about testosterone poisoning in uh, our adolescent years where the mortality of young men spike. But, you know, maybe testosterone um, increases our chances of certain types of cancer. We don't know for sure, but I don't think it has to be. I think men and women have equal capacity of making it to 100. So, Dan, what's next on your agenda with regards to Blue Zones? Well, I'm pretty happy with this Blue Zone, um, this uh, Living to 100 documentary. It was number one this week. I, I think it might be down to number two. So, you know, I've, I've written books for years and nothing has nearly been as impactful as this Netflix. So maybe try to do another Netflix series. Um you know, I, I have a I have a similar body of work around happiness, and I'm really interested in this notion of healthy life expectancy, which is different than blue zones. And then uh, I teamed up with uh, the CEO of Vital Farms and the CEO of Whole Foods, and we created a line of whole food, plant based food called Blue Zone Kitchen, with a maniacal focus on deliciousness, and they'll be in. Uh, Whole Foods, every Whole Foods uh, store in America will have our frozen food, uh, no added, you know, non-processed, no added sugars, the healthiest food you'll find. And uh, I challenge you, it's uh, it's the most delicious thing in the freezer section. And, and that's kind of a new new horizon for me. When will that be available to people? Well, if you live in Seattle at town and country stores, it's available this week. But it'll be in, in Whole Foods in November. All right. All right. Well, we've been challenged on that uh, and looking forward to this. <laughs> um, if you don't like uh, it, call me. I'll give you a dollar back. <laughs> okay. All right. There you go. Uh, money back guaranteed from Dan Butner. Uh, fantastic. So, Dan, my, my last question, um, uh, focusing on the U.S., um, I mean, we, we know about Loma Linda. You've written about that um, uh, extensively. Are there other places around the U.S. that you see if they've might gotten to the blue zones or at least moving in the right directions? Are there success stories we should all, uh, in, 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 the connect, in, in a world, in a country with so many problems, are there any success stories that you're excited about? Well, all of our 72 blue zone project cities, uh, uh, Scottsdale, Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona are just coming in, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I, you know, natural blue zones, um, Santa Barbara, California, they have a light city council that, that uh, made that place very walkable and favored. Uh, you know, one of the great pastimes of the weekend is going down to a year-long farmer's market. 
Uh, that uh, San Luis Obispo, the same thing. I, I did a cover story for National Geographic on Boulder, Colorado. And uh, enlightened city council there makes it easier to bike across town than it is to drive across town. They have illegalized billboards. You know, if you live in a neighborhood with billboard advertising, you're about 10% more likely to be obese, uh, probably just because of the prompt to eat the junk food they market. Uh, they, this city has made the decision, well, we don't need billboards. And guess what? Nobody misses it. And it, it, uh, it fosters into a more aesthetic and healthier environment. They bought, they purchased the land around downtown and created a green belt. So people living and working downtown within a few minutes, they can be walking in nature. Um, these are great models that have produced manifestly healthier, happier people that, you know, any mayor worth his or her salt ought to be paying attention and say, we want to replicate that in our city instead of being swayed by, um, you know, business interests who, you know, have their business interests in mind instead of the well-being of the people. So um, we're close to the top of the hour, but Dan, I have, I have one question given how much press you've been doing recently. Um, what's the one question no one has asked you yet? Ha <laughs> ha, that's a very good one. <laughs> um, so nobody, wow, that's a, okay. Well, nobody has asked me what my favorite bean is. <laughs> I, I I am the self-appointed king of beans. I think America, <laughs> the secret to American longevity is eating more beans, making it taste. And my favorite beans are garbanzo beans because oh. you can make hummus out of them and you can just cook them and add a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper. They're delicious. I put them in soups. I roast them to, as a snack. They're cheap. They're versatile. Um Garbanzo beans is the way to go. Canned or dry? <laughs> I look. I but you know I'm not a big fan of cans because the world doesn't need another <laughs> can. Um, it's uh, dry beans are so easy. You just the night before you throw them in water. It takes twenty seconds, and then with an instant pot you throw them in an instant pot and hit hit a button, and twenty minutes later they're ready. And they're cheaper that way. They taste better. You can get them al dente, so it has that kind of meaty uh, finish to them. And and uh, I just yeah, beans. I can't I can't say enough about them. And by the way, I, I'm not sponsored by the bean industry. This is hundred percent Dan Butner. I I know how to make beans sing on the way in, not on the way out. <laughs> All right, that's uh, that is a great way to end this conversation. Uh, Dan Views are not sponsored by the bean industry by Big Bean. Uh, there are uh, Kate has been posting places you can find out more about Dan at uh, bluezones.com and danbutner.com. Tons of information, both places. Thank you, Dan, for this wonderful conversation. Uh, and everyone, just a reminder you can get Dan's new book, The Blue Zones Secrets for Living Longer Lessons from the Healthiest Place on Earth. And let's get uh, live live to one hundred secrets to the blue zones back to number one on on Netflix. Um, ah, I love you guys. Thank you, thank you for that, Dan. Thank you and very as a further, much. As a further reminder, our next longevity book club event will be October first at four p.m. Eastern. When we'll be talking with Narina Hertz about her book, "The Lonely Century: A Call to Reconnect." Hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all.